last time who informed me that you can scoop kitty litter if you're pregnant. I'm going to use that one against my loving wife. So thanks for that. Uh, okay, I have a couple of announcements to start out our lecture. Um, a couple of sessions that we're going to run this week to help people out with various things. So one is that uh, I know that some of you folks came in from the 106 AJ class in JavaScript. And you know, since that class is relatively new, we figured that there might be more difficulty transitioning from that class and that language, JavaScript, to, to us here in 106B. So if you took 106 AJ and you want some help transitioning from the language uh, change, we're going to do this session tonight at 7 PM in Hewlett Building Room 101. Uh, that is, again, that's meant for 106 AJ people. It's going to be focusing on differences between JavaScript and C++. I would say if you came from 106A, the regular version in Java, or if you came from some other kind of programming background like Python or something, I would recommend maybe not going to this session because it won't be tailored to your specific uh, needs. But if you took 106 AJ, I would encourage you to go this evening at 7. Uh, our section leader, Shreya, is going to lead that, uh, that session. OK. Um, so another session that you might want to know about is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in Tresiter. We're going to do a cute creator setup help session because I think a lot of people end up sort of stuck or halfway across that setup process getting a cute creator working and some kind of error message pops up and they don't know how to fix it. So hey, bring in your laptop and we'll fix it for you. We'll get it working, hopefully. And so that's tomorrow at 7 o'clock in Tresiter. And there's going to be uh, some of our TAs and some of our section leaders there. We're going to have several people there helping out with all the crazy cute creator bugs that, that come up. Okay? So I encourage you to go to that. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I'm going to send you guys an email tomorrow that I want you to sign up for sections. I want you to submit your preferences of times. Uh, you'll do that between Thursday this week and this coming Sunday. And then at the start of next week, we'll assign you to your section. So I'm going to start sending a reminder about that tomorrow. You won't be able to do that until tomorrow afternoon. It doesn't open up until Thursday. OK, so that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, just as a recap, you know, a lot of the stuff we do gets posted on the website under the lecture page. If you click the link that says lectures, you can scroll down and I'll post like the video of the class that I record on my computer here. I'll post all the code that we write, all the slides that we do, a zip of the Cute Creator project that we worked on. So, you know, I'll do that again after, after this class as well, right? All right, so let's get back into it. Uh, we were learning about C++. We were learning, I just, I started to talk about functions. Hey, I heard a code step by step right there, thanks. Um, so, I wrote a function called song that printed some, some messages, some lyrics that I thought were useful, and then I repeated it twice. I called the function twice from the main part of my program, right? Okay, so that all works. That works fine. But right at the end of lecture, what I showed you was that if you cut this function and pasted it down at the bottom like that, the same program doesn't compile anymore. This line up here produces an error, and it says, sorry, I can't mm -hmm. control here. It says song was not declared. And this is literally just a C++ quirk where it has to have things declared before they're used. In Java or a lot of other languages like JavaScript, you can call a function and then down lower in the file you can write the, the definition of that function and it'll understand, it'll figure it out. C++, not so much. So this is annoying. One way to fix the problem is to just always declare the function up above main, but I think a pretty common style is to have main first and then the other functions after. So uh, if you want to do that, then the way that you need to do this, let me jump to my slides now. You have to do something, uh, this is the, the problem that we're having. This is a different function example, but if you try to call a function and then write its body, you'll get an error. It doesn't matter what the function does, it's just calculating something. But the way you fix this in C++ is you use something called a function prototype. What you do is you write out the heading of the function, the return type, the name, the parameter types, and then you put a semicolon. And you're basically, you're telling the compiler, it's like an IOU. I promise later I'm going to write this function. <laughs> so please don't give me compiler errors if I try to call that function. And now the program works. Now the program compiles. So uh, how I do this, how I think a lot of programmers do this, is you sort of write the function. Where am I? You're down here. You write the function. And then once you're done writing it, you copy the heading. And you go up here to the top of the program after the imports. And you paste that same heading, but you put a semicolon. And again, that's called a function prototype. Okay, now I compile and it works and it behaves the same way. So that's just a little C++ thing that we have to work around. Okay. 
And again, if there were any parameters, you know, if this took an int x, I'd have to write int x here, and down below I'd put int x down there. The, the headings would match from the prototype to the body of the function later on, okay? So um, let me talk a little more about functions. That's kind of where I'm going with lecture today. So let me actually back up a few slides. Um, this comes from chapters two and three of the book. There are some pre-existing functions that you can call without even having to write them. Uh, some of them are about math and calculating things. There's a library called CMath that you can include. The include for the CMath, it uses those angle brackets. Do you remember how there's sometimes quotes for including and sometimes angle brackets? Do you remember the difference? What do I know about CMath library by seeing those angle brackets? <laughs> uh, Pam, somebody, yeah. Uh, it's, a it's a standard system library that comes with the language, right? It's not from Stanford, it's not from our project locally, it's from the, globally from the language, yeah. So this comes with every C++ installation. These are functions that should be somewhat familiar. Most languages have functions that are like this, absolute value, exponentiation, trigonometry, square root, these kinds of things are in here. In Java, I know not everybody comes from Java, but if you do come from Java, you have to write this word math in front. You say math.pow, math.sign. Uh, in C++, you don't write math. Dot. You just write the name of the function. You just say sign or square root or pow. Okay, so those are useful. I'm not going to go into them in great detail because I'm guessing you've seen these kind of operations before, but we might need them later. Okay, so where am I? Uh, we talked about the declaration order, we talked about the prototype. So let me teach you a few things that C++ does differently about functions. Here's a cool feature, it's called default parameters. This is uh, if you want to have a parameter whose value is optional, you can declare the parameter in the heading of the function, but then you can say equals and give it a value. So the idea is that the, the caller can pass a value, or if they don't pass a value, you'll use this default instead. So I wrote a function called print line that you pass in a number and a character and it'll print that character repeated that many times. Just a little utility function. But what I decided was if you don't pass the parameters, I'll use a default number of repetitions of 10 and a default character of an asterisk. So if you say print line five, you're passing only the width but not the character. So now I print five copies of the default character, the asterisk. If you pass no parameters, I'll do a default of 10 copies of an asterisk. It's a little bit of a silly example, but I'm just trying to show this idea. Um, there is kind of an ordering issue here. Uh, the parameters go left to right, so there's no way to pass the character without the width in this example. If you omit things, you can only omit to the right, you might say. So anyway, that's a feature that's sometimes useful in the language. It allows us to have a variable number of arguments to a, to a function, okay? Java doesn't have that. JavaScript has that, but JavaScript allows almost anything, so <laughs> C++ and JavaScript share that in some ways. Um, that's default parameters. We won't use that very much this week. I want to talk about how parameters work in a little bit more detail because C++ has some differences from other languages. So uh, there's a concept that you might not know the name for, but you probably implicitly understand. It's called value semantics, which means when you pass a parameter, what you're really doing is you're passing a copy of the value of that parameter. So a way that that manifests is that, for example, in this program, I'm trying to write a function called swap. You pass in two ints and I swap their values so that at the end of the swap function, a has the value that used to be in B, and B has the value that used to be in A, right? Do you understand those three lines? I put A into a temp, I put B's value into A, then I put temp's value into B, right? So at the end of that function, I have swapped the values. But when I come back to main and I print the values out, it still prints X and Y having the same values that they had before. Do you understand why that's the case? Like the function swap didn't really do anything. Do you understand? Um, you probably saw this, or at least saw uh, occurrences of this kind of behavior in 106A or AD or wherever you come from. Because those variables up there, the parameters A and B, those become copies of the values of X and Y that pass in. So if I swap the A and B, I'm swapping the copies, I'm not swapping the original variables. Okay? So that's called value semantics. That's the fancy term for that idea, right? Not every parameter behaves this way. In 106A, uh, can you think of examples of parameters when you pass them in, if you change their values, that you would still see the change back in main or run or wherever you called from? If you pass a G object, an object, uh, anything else that you could pass? <coughs> yes? If you pass an array and then you change the elements in the array, then you come back to main, the array has still been changed in main. Yeah, so there are certain kinds of values that you saw in a previous course that do change when you pass them in, but simple things like ints like this it makes a copy, right? So this idea of making a copy is this value semantics idea. 
That other form of behavior where you pass in something and it is able to be changed, that's the other kind of semantics, which is called reference semantics. So I want to talk about that for a second. Reference semantics means when you pass a parameter, you actually are sharing the original variable from one function to the next. Reference semantics in many languages are automatically determined by data type. What you guys just said was, well, if I pass an array, it shares. If I pass a G object, it shares. But if I pass an int, it copies. So it seems like implicitly what type of value you pass alters the behavior that the parameter will use. But in C++, that's not the way that it works. In C++, every data type can be passed either as a value or as a reference. So this piece of code right here is an example of passing integers as references. And so what this means, I, uh, the syntax we're doing so is to write an ampersand after the variable type in the parameter up in the function there. And what that means when I say swap int ampersand a int ampersand b, what that means is a and b really are x and y. They're the same. They're not copies. They are the same as each other. The names a and b are aliases for x and y. And so if I modify a and b up there, it really does modify a and b, or x and y down here. So now the function, on the last slide, the output was 1735, but this one is 35. It did swap them, 17, uh, 35 and 17, OK? Um, in a language like Java, if you pass in information as a parameter, and then you want to change that information or compute something new, how do you get that information out of the function back to main or back to where you called from? Usually use a return for that. You return a value. C++, you can return values, or you can do this. This is a different way of sending information out of a function. You pass it in as a reference, and then you change what the reference refers to. So this is kind of an interesting concept. Um, and we're going to take advantage of this when we're programming, because basically any data type, when we want to use it as a parameter, we need to decide, do we want to copy it when we pass it, or do we want to share it when we pass it? So that's a decision we need to make. A particular uh, example of this Here's an example called an output parameter. I don't know if you guys ever seen this comic XKCD. It's kind of a silly, geeky comic on the web. They have this funny thing where it's like, you can date people that are this far away from your age, but not more. It's just a silly idea. I don't, I don't think it means anything. But their formula is age two plus seven is the youngest person you should date. And then the opposite of that is the oldest person you should date. So <laughs> if, you, if you wanted to write a function to calculate, what's my age range I'm allowed to date according to this dumb formula? Well, how would you do it? Because you'd need to return two things. You would need to return the minimum age and the maximum age to get the range. You know what I mean? So how do you return two things? Well, you can't, but you can have two reference parameters, min and max. And you can fill in values for those, and that basically sends out those values to the caller. So you just pass in the, um, the dating range. You, you, you pass in if you're 48 years old. You pass that as age, which I'm doing right here in the main part of the program. And then these variables, young and old, I fill them in with this min and max value according to this formula. And so at the end of the function, young has this value for min and old has this value for max. And so I've, I've used those parameters not to pass in information, but to provide a storage space to put output information out of the function. Okay? And so actually you'll notice when I declare young and old, I haven't even assigned any values to them in main. Do you see that? Isn't it interesting? You can pass these as parameters without them having any value because the whole point is that it doesn't use the value, it just stores a new value instead. It replaces whatever value used to be there, okay? So that idea is called an output parameter. So I'm just excited because in a few years, I'll be able to take 82 year olds and uh, they're frisky and they've got money, so all right. Uh, yes. And I hope they clean litter boxes too, but anyway. Um, that's an example of an output parameter. It's also an example of kind of sending out two pieces of information. If you were only going to return one thing, you might just use a return for that. But since you want to output two things, these reference parameters make a good choice. Okay? So hey, let's practice. Let's write an equation called quadratic. You know quadratic equations, right? Negative b plus or minus radical b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Quadratic formula, right? Um, for solving quadratic equations of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So if you wanted to write the quadratic equation as a C++ function, what parameters would it take and what would their types be? And which parameters, if any, would be passed by reference and which would be passed by value? Any thoughts? What do you think? Uh, in a, B, C. Okay, A, B, and C. So let me, let me start writing as you tell me what to do here. Um, Wait, this is last lecture's program. I'm going to close that one. I've got another one. 
here. Um, so you want me to write a quadratic function, and then you said int a, int b, int c to match the sort of a squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Okay, are there any other parameters? Like the, the, the output of this is that a quadratic equation usually has two real roots, not always, but usually. So those roots would be real numbers. How do I present those roots to the person who calls this function? Somebody's hand was up. Yeah, what do you think? Okay, yeah, um, pass them by reference. So like, those end up being real numbers. So maybe double ampersand root number one and double ampersand uh, root number two or something like that. Right, you, you might say you want to return them, but since there's two of them, it's hard to return them. You'd have to return an array of them or something. That seems kind of silly. So just take them as references and fill in those, like I did with that Dex KCD dating thing. Um, does the function return any value here on the left? I mean, I think the result is these roots, right? So I think that's the main thing I need to produce. So maybe I don't need to return anything. I just use output parameters to output information. You might be thinking, well, why don't I just use C out to print the results, the roots? Why do you think that might be? Is it better to store the results in these variables? Or is it better to print it out or both? Or how do you decide such a thing? What do you think? Yeah, he's right. Uh, you said it's more versatile. If you just print them, great. You see them on the console, but then they're gone. What if you want to calculate them and use that as part of some larger calculation or something else in the program? You can't, basically. It's printed and it's gone. So returning it is more versatile. That's exactly right. So that's what I think we should do. So um, you know, the idea would be that the way you would call this thing would be like up in main here. You'd say, I want to declare some variables to store roots. I don't have to give them any values. And then I'll call quadratic. I'll pass in values for A and B and C, and then these variables are, be, are going to be where I'll store the results that are getting calculated, okay? Quick question, why would I pass these not as references? Why, do I, why not int ampersand for A, B, and C? How do I decide that? What do you think? Yeah? They're not going to change and you don't need them. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to change the value of A, B, and C, so why share? You know, you don't always want to share things, right? I mean, do you share phones with your friends? No, because you want your own space. Do you share, uh, well, you do share a dorm with somebody probably, but you probably wish that you didn't, right? So you probably wish you could delete that ampersand and then whatever, I don't know what the analogy is here. But um, yeah, I think if your goal is not to modify the thing, you don't need to make it an ampersand, a, a reference. Um, some students start worrying about efficiency, like if I make it a reference, do I save memory? Does it go faster? Don't worry about that. Like that it, maybe on some microscopic level, but not enough to matter. The compiler is really good at optimizing things anyway, so that's not how you make your program go fast. Don't worry about that. Or, or how you save memory. Insert four bytes of memory. There's nothing. Don't worry about it. So, uh, okay, let's actually do the calculation here. So remember that the um, quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus radical b squared minus 4ac over 2a, right? So um, let's see if I can, maybe I can try to do that part. Uh, negative b you can't say plus or minus, so we're going to do it as plus once and minus once. Plus the square root. If I want the square root, that's one of those C math functions. I can say squirt. Um, squirt comes from including C math in our program. So the square root of, was it B squared minus 4AC? B times B minus 4 times A times C. And then it's all of that over 2A, right? So all of that divided by 2a, there. So that is root 1, right? And then root 2 is the same, but instead of plus, it's minus, because it's plus or minus. That's the two roots. I think if you wanted to be more efficient, you might pull this part out. Isn't that called the determinant or discriminant or something like that? So maybe I'd call it, a, I forget which one, is it discriminant? Double D equals that. So then I, maybe I'd say D, so I don't have to calculate that thing twice, or I don't know, whatever, right? If you, can, you can optimize a little bit here. And then this second one becomes root two. So that's it. I calculate the two roots. <laughs> Hopefully I got the formula right. Um, so now I'm calling it down here in main. Let's see if I got the right answer. So it says the roots are four and negative one. Does that sound right? X minus four times X plus one. 
I think that looks right, doesn't it? Yeah? <laughs> We're in CS, so it's almost mandatory that we all would suck at math, like basic simple algebra and math and stuff, but I think that's right. Uh, I've found I, I get the most embarrassed when I try to do just like addition and subtraction. It's amazing, like the more people who are watching you, the more you can't add like single digit numbers or something, but whatever. Um, anyway, looks like it's working. The main point of this example is to play with reference parameters and just talk about parameter passing in C++. So do you guys have any questions about this or about reference parameters? Yeah? Uh, if you're using pass by reference, can you pass just like the number one or the number minus four? Oh, that's an interesting question. So if this is a reference, what if I just wrote like 42 here? So now like 42 is root one. So now am I gonna change the value of 42 to be some other value? Like the, at 42 is, has some existential crisis and turns into some other value now. Um, the answer is that doesn't work. I mean, I can, I can show you. If you try to compile, it'll say, uh, I mean, the error is confusing. It says you cannot use a double reference with a literal double value, basically. Uh, you can't pass a literal value, just a number, as, uh, for a reference parameter. You have to pass a memory location, basically a variable. You have to pass a place that could be referred to in the memory. Yeah, so that, that wouldn't work. Any other questions about reference parameters? Yeah. Uh, your program won't account if there is no solution to the question, right? This is true. This program assumes that there are two real roots to the quadratic equation. That's not always the case. Uh, I believe that the way you de determine that is you look at this D here. The sine of D, I believe, tells you how many real roots there are. So uh, I think just in the interest of moving on, I'm going to leave it broken. But you would at the very least say assumes two real roots, or you'd say to do, <laughs> uh, if else, on D sine value. So you'd have something like where you would check whether you had two roots or not. Yeah, this wouldn't work for certain values of A, B, and C. Uh, yeah? Uh, kind of a follow-up to passing 42 as a perimeter, what's your favorite to object? What if I pass in a new object? Like you, instead of root 1, you said that something new object is Yeah, I see. If you pass in some kind of new object here. I mean, I would say the simple answer is you pass in a variable name, because a variable name represents a location in memory. And really, a reference is like, I want to share that memory from main to quadratic. And so you can't pass anything that doesn't have a storage location. It could be a name of a variable. It could be an index of an array. It has to be a place that you have allocated space to put something. And the simplest answer to that would be a variable. So if you just declared a new object right where I've got this highlight and you haven't stored it as any name yet, it would not like that either. So yeah, variable name is the simplest answer. Good questions, any more? Yeah? What types are passed um, by reference by default? Like oh, what types of things are by default passed by reference? The answer is nothing. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, every single thing is passed as a copy in C++ unless you put an ampersand. And so as I'll, uh, maybe I'm spoiling ahead for a minute, but like if you have a big thing like a, a, an array with a million elements and you want to pass it as a parameter, you actually don't want to copy those million elements. That takes a lot of memory and time. So you actually would pass certain things like that by reference, by, you, would, you would make sure to put those ampersands, but you have to do it. C++ never does it for you. You always have to decide to pass things by reference yourself. So just something you have to think about that maybe in other languages you don't as much have to think about. Okay, um, so I wanna say, uh, the last thing I wanna say about functions and parameters and stuff, when you're solving a big problem, you have to think about how to break down the problem into smaller chunks. We sometimes call this decomposing a problem, your decomp. There are good and bad decomps. I'm not gonna spend time in 106B to lecture on that. I think of it as a 106A topic, but I do think it's a topic a lot of students could use a refresher on. I have written a handout on the class website in the handouts area. It's called Procedural Decomposition Handout. I would suggest that you take a look at it. It has some examples of code that I think are well decomposed and not so well decomposed. When you turn in your homework, we will grade you on having well decomposed code. So maybe you want to look at the handout for a good example or a, or a counter example or both of how to decompose a problem. There are certain you know, sizes of functions that are better than others. There are certain <coughs> dependencies between functions that are better or worse than others. So uh, just my general suggestion would be to go refresh on that a little if you figure you're rusty on how to decompose a large problem, okay? I think a good simple heuristic to look at is if you look at main, does main have a good summary of what the overall program is gonna do? Or does main have everything? That's bad. Or does main only have one line? 
Main jumps to some other place, and the other place does all of the work. That's probably bad, too. Main should be a little summary. It should have a you know, certain small number of lines in it that mostly call other functions to do chunks of the work together. Okay. Go take a look at that handout if you want more information. Um, so I want to keep moving. I just It's a lot of material to pack into the, each, each lecture. So I want to talk about strings in C++. You probably know about strings already, but I'll try to focus on the things that are different or unique about strings in C++. So you know what a string is, right? It's a collection of characters. So you say string s equals hello. Uh, in C++, if you want to use strings, you have to include a string library, because nothing comes for free in C++. So you say include string, and it's got the angle brackets, so you know that's a system thing. And now you can say string s equals hello. String could be any number of characters from zero to many, right? Um, so a lot of the things, you're, you're, a lot of your instincts about strings from Java or JavaScript are going to be fine in here. So like they have indexes that start at zero, and you can slice out different characters, and you can do operations to capitalize lowercase and convert the string and take a substring and search for things. Like a lot of that's all here. It's just maybe slightly different method names or whatever. The bad news is that C++ has two different types of strings, and that leads to bugs. I will try to help you understand the difference in a minute, but. It sucks. Basically, this is one of the many things Marty doesn't like about C++, is that there are two types of strings. They messed up. Oh, well. Um, let me show you some examples. So here's a couple things that are more familiar. So you know, if you declare a string, the characters have zero-based indexes. So this example here, uh, the indexes go from 0 to 7. The individual characters themselves are stored as values of a data type called care. If you come from Java, that's basically the same as Java. If you come from JavaScript, JavaScript doesn't really have that concept. Everything's a string, even if it's only one letter long. In C++ and Java, the individual characters are a different type called care, which is a primitive data type. So if you want to access the individual characters, you can do that using square brackets. So like S bracket 3 is the fourth character, the character at index 3. It's the letter D in this example here. That's kind of cool. In Java, if you want to access an individual character, do you remember how to do that? There's a method called care at. There's also a method called substring. So you know, little different syntax. Actually, this syntax is slightly better. One of the small moments where C++ does something better than Java. Thank you. Um, the individual characters are stored as these care values. Care values can be converted to and from int freely. Character values are actually just integer encoding. So if you cast a character into an int, it'll give you some number. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that later, maybe. But anyway, that's what's inside of a string. There are various operations you can do on a string. You can concatenate strings with plus. So like if I have string mar and I concatenate ty, I get marty. That's cool. Um, one thing you can do in C++ that you cannot do in Java is you can ask which string comes before or after the other one in alphabetical order. Or you can ask whether they are equal to each other by saying equals equals or not equals. So if I ask whether s1 is greater than s2, I'm asking whether the string marty comes later in alphabetical order than the string Cynthia. It's case sensitive. It uses those numeric ASCII encodings to do the comparison. But that's a good way of comparing ordering of strings. You can say equals equals or not equals to ask whether a string equals a certain text or not. Uh, in Java, do you remember, you're not supposed to use equals equals to compare strings in Java. JavaScript is fine. In Java, do you remember how to compare a string to another string? You have to write dot E-Q-U-A-L-S, like a method or something. C++ got this one right. You can just say equals equals like every other type. That's cool. Um, so a couple things that are nice here, right? Um, one interesting thing, I, this is subtle. I, I think this would be lost for some students. That, uh, strings in Java and JavaScript are what are called immutable strings. Once you make a string, its value never changes. You might say, that's not true. I made a string once, and then I capitalized it, and it totally worked. You're wrong, Marty. Um, but actually, what you did was you created a new second string that was capitalized, and you replaced the first one with the second one. You never actually change a string once you make it. You just replace it with a different string. Uh, in C++, you can change a string. So you can call these methods like append and erase and stuff, and they will change the string that you've stored. You can also just reach into those indexes and change what's stored up there. You can, you can change whatever to O, oh, and now instead of mar step, it's mar stop. Code stop by stop, I guess. Um, slightly different than, than Java, but maybe for most cases won't, won't affect your coding style very much. So these are just some little things that you could do with strings. Question? What's the 3-2? I'll show you that I have a, a table on the next slide of the methods, but it basically means go to index 3 and delete two characters from there. So it deletes the T and the Y, because those are indexes 3 and 4 of the um, string. So yeah, I, I admit that I didn't show you that method yet. I'm just giving some quick example. I think here, here's the slide. Erase takes index and length. Starting there, this many characters, cut them out of the, out of the string. Yeah? Uh, in the previous slide, why was mar bigger than Cynthia? 
Why was Mar bigger than Cynthia? Um, I think it was M later in alphabetical order than C. So it just, the later one is greater. Later is greater, earlier is less. In the same way that ints, if you lined up ints, the smaller ones would be first and the, the larger ints would be later. Just an alphabetical comparison. Actually, when I made the slide, it was a joke because I was co-teaching with this woman named Cynthia Lee and I just wanted to act like I was greater than her, kind of, you know. Which is funny because she's way awesomer than me, but I, I, in Stringland, I get to be greater than her at least. Um, so here are some of these methods. My guess is that most of these methods are fairly self-explanatory. Maybe it's a different name for something you've already called in Java or JavaScript. Like, for example, in Java, you can say substring, but in C++, it's substr. But you know what I mean, it's not that different, right? You can say find to look for something instead of I think it's called index of in Java. You can ask for length, that's the same as uh, a lot of languages. So I don't know, a lot of these methods are, are shouldn't be too shocking. Maybe the only one that's weird is when you search for things, when you say find. You know in, in, uh, in these methods that search for things, they usually return you an int, like what index the thing was found at, right? Like if you say Marty step and you search for step, it'll find the index of uh, six, right? Because the, the the S starts there, whatever. But if you search for something that's not found in most languages, how does it return, what end does it return to indicate not found usually? Like some negative number, negative one, like it's not found, negative one, that's error, right? In C++, it doesn't return negative one, it returns string colon colon NPOS, no position or whatever, I don't know. So that's kind of dumb. So some students will write, does it equal negative one? And that'll always be false because it's returning N pause or whatever. But I don't know, some of this is a little weird, but I think this is manageable weird at this point, right? Um, any questions so far about the strings or string methods? Yeah? How does S start with variables? How do you get negative one, zero? Oh, the S dot compare, it's a lot like Java's notion of compare to, where if you pass in, if you have two strings, the one that's less will be negative one compared to the one that's greater. If they're equal, it'll be zero. If the one you're on the left is bigger, it'll be a positive one. So it returns a signed integer to indicate the relative ordering of the two strings. Yeah? Is S part of the name? No, uh, when I show these tables, the part that's like in italic or bold is the like sort of placeholder part. Like whatever your variable is called, you would write that variable's name there. So if you have a string called name, you'd write name.compare, name.erase. Okay, any other string questions? Yeah. Why does string end pause, why is that not in quote marks? Well, the, the quote marks are when you want to create a new value that's a string. This is some variable name, NPOS, that's stored inside of the string class. And so they already made that, that's a variable. And variables names don't go in quotes, but string values go in quotes. And so this is like a library of strings comes with this variable inside of it. So if you were to say cout name.mar, um, would it what would it be looking for? Uh, well, I think NPOS is some number. Okay. It's some magic number. It's probably a really big or really small integer number. So whatever that number is, we, do you want to see? We can always try, right? So uh, let's do include string, and then let's do uh, string name equals Marty step, and then let's do see out uh, name, and then let's do see out uh, n pause is string n pause end all. My guess is it's some big crazy number. It's that. <laughs> I think the idea being that it's probably not at that index, so that means it ain't anywhere, uh, I guess. So yeah, uh, there you go. That's, I didn't know that, but that's what the value of NPOS. Okay. Another question, yeah. What does that number represent? It's just a constant, it's just some magic number. It's probably the largest possible value for an integer in 64-bit integers, so it's probably just that's the max value, so therefore, it, if it's that far along, it can't possibly be found in the string. So it's just a constant value. I mean, basically, you don't have to worry about what that value is. You just, if you're searching for something, either you'll get an integer index back, or if it's not found, we'll get that integer back. So if it's that value, it means it wasn't found. If it isn't that value, it's an index that you can use. Okay, so these are strings. Um, here are some more string functions. We felt 
at Stanford that the C++ strings were missing a few things that were helpful from Java, JavaScript, from other modern languages. So we made a library called strlib in quotes. That's our local Stanford library. It has some functions like starts with, ends with, uh, to uppercase, to lowercase. Those are not present in the default string library. Um, we also include some functions for converting strings to and from other data types, like to, to integer or to double, this kind of stuff. Um, C++ sort of includes these things in other ways, but it's harder to do. We wanted to make it easier. One little thing about the syntax is that the methods we wrote are sort of external functions where you have to pass the string as a parameter, as opposed to the ones on the previous slide, which are methods inside of the string where you say the string name and then a dot and then what method you want to call. So like, for example, if I want to do the uppercase version of Marty Step, um, I can't come over here and say, name dot to uppercase that method it's not it's not auto completing anything because there's no such method instead what you do is you include this uh, strlib string library dot h and then down here again you still don't say to uppercase what you do instead is you say to uppercase name and that function returns an uppercase version of the string so you have to say name equals the capitalized version of itself that's similar to what you probably remember from Java or something. So now when I print the name, it's Marty Step. It's shouting at you, right? So there you go. So these functions, there's other functions in that library as well. You can look on the class website to see the other function names. Yeah. Is the Sterling in addition to the available library, or is it part of the same library? Is it like <laughs> it's uh, on top of all these. The, so the idea is the actual string objects themselves come with these. That's part of the C++ string class. These ones over here, like once somebody's already written a class, you can't add more methods to the class. So we can't make our methods be like inside of the string, but we can write external functions that you pass in the string and we'll do something to it. So ours are in addition to the last slide. I guess, does it include those or do we need to put both? Oh, like do you have to include both strlib and string? I think technically our strlib includes string and so you do get both, but it, I think it's best practice to just include everything that you think you need. Yeah. Somebody else hand up? Did I miss your question? Okay. So, uh, oh, I, I don't want to brush over these conversion functions. These are helpful. Converting an integer to a string and vice versa. So, like, if you have a string like, um, uh, you know, int or a string age stir equals 42. That's like somebody's age or whatever. And you want to get the int 42. A lot of people have this instinct that you want to like cast things. They go like int age equals int 42 because you've learned you can like, some, some people have learned this idea that you can type cast between different types. I think in JavaScript there's a function called parse int or whatever, but um, that doesn't work. What you need to do instead is you need to call our function that's called string to integer and you pass uh, age stir and then um, it'll return the int 42 you know and now you can calculate things using that int if you leave it as a string you can't do numerical calculations on it and there's the same process if you have the int 42 and you want the string 42 for some reason there's a string to integer there's also an integer to string okay so uh, here's a little exercise problem I'm being mean. I'm mixing a bunch of things that we've learned today. I'm mixing references. I've got strings. Let's take a look at it for a second. I've got multiple choices over on the right. Why don't you look at it and we'll have to talk about it in a minute. What's the output? So somebody who's very brave, who wants to tell me that they think the right answer is. What do you think? Uh, D. Marty Stefupa. Stefupa? Okay, how do you get that? Let's see. Um, so we pass in A and B, which is Marty and Step, right? So Marty is this and Step is that. Okay, so I'm, I erase the M from Marty right here. 
But on your answer, you still have the M in the output down here. So why is the M still there? It's not passed by reference. It's passed as a regular parameter. It's a copy of the string. So when I delete the letter M, that change will not go back to main. OK, so that eliminates answers A, C, and E then. And then we say B plus equals character 0. Character 0 of string A at this point in the first letter is the letter A, right? Because the M is deleted. So B becomes stepa, I think. And then we insert foo, so it becomes stefupa. Those changes to B, B was passed as a reference, so those are directly modifying the B variable down there in main, so they persist. So when we print, A is unblemished and B has changed. So yeah, I think you're right. I think it's D. If you didn't get it, that's okay. I mean, you just saw references for the first time today. But you might want to practice. There are some more problems in code step by step that have reference parameters and stuff like this. Um, I do like on my tests, I like to have a mixture of code writing questions and code reading. I'll show you some code and I'll say, what does it do? So you have to kind of puzzle through these little mystery problems and see what the output will be. Do you guys have questions about this problem? Does it make sense? I try to avoid saying makes sense because I guess Jerry Kane. <laughs> one of our other professors, he says makes sense a lot, and I guess somebody took a cut of all the times he said it, and they spliced him, you guys seen this thing? It's on YouTube, he's like, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. It's like a minute and a half of that. <laughs> and now I'm terrified whatever my thing is that I say every day, I'm afraid you guys will splice those all together. Probably just a super cut of all the swear words is what I'm guessing, but um, uh, yeah, anyway. Go watch that. It's on the Stanford memes page. Um, oh, I'm on there. I'm on there. <laughs> I'm on the Berkeley one, too. Yeah. OK, anyway, so let's keep moving. Um, you can read strings from the keyboard. You can ask the user to type in a string. You can say, hey, what's your name? And wait for them to type in an answer. We did that last lecture where they type an integer. We said get integer. You can also say get line to read a line from the user. I talked last time about how there's a C in, and you could just use C in directly. I said, though, that I think C in isn't very good and that maybe it's not a good choice. And one other reason why C in is bad is that when you're trying to read a string, it only reads one word at a time. So if you say your name's John Doe, it'll only read the John part. So that's kind of weird. Most people expect that when you press enter, everything you type to that point is your input. So we have a, a function called get line. You say what the prompt message should be and it'll ask them that message, and then it'll wait for them to type a line. It'll return the entire line. So I think that's the right way to do it. Confusingly, there's already a get line function in the standard library, but it has a slightly different parameter set. So I recommend the one in the middle in blue there. That's the library version of get line to read input from the user that's a string. OK, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on that slide. Uh, let's do a little exercise problem together. Uh, let's write a function called name diamond. You pass a string parameter, and you print out uh, sort of a diamond pattern of the letters of the string like that. Okay? I want that to be the console output of the function. So maybe you can help me. If you, if you want to play along, this one is on the step-by-step -step site. Um, so let's write name diamond. So of course what I always want first is you to tell me the heading. What parameters does name diamond take? That's a string, right? So string s, OK. What's the return type of name diamond? Yeah, I mean, you said void. Some people might have said string. You know, I see people get a little confused on this because the result of this function is to print text. And so people go, oh, text, that's a string. So it returns a string. But I don't want you to return the string. I've asked you to print out the string as output. I want that output on the console. I don't want you to return that. I want you to output that. They're different. If I ask you to solve a problem and I want you to return something, I will definitely use the word return in the description of the problem. I will say return this or return that or whatever. If I don't use the word return, I'm hinting that you don't need to return anything. So yeah, I want you to print output. It's a void method. So OK, I need to print M, M-A, M-A-R-T, all that. So um, how do I do it? Somebody help me out. So again, it prints. Uh, uh, M and then M A and then M A R M A R T M A R T Y. Then it starts printing R D R D T Y. Right. So how do I do it? I'll accept partial answers. Get me started. Tell me something that would be a helpful start. In the back. What do you think? Yeah. 
okay, make us a, a do indexes in a for loop. I think I can I can do that part for int i equals zero and i is less than the string length. So it's called s dot length. Okay. So now what? What am I doing each line? What do you say, sir? Okay, right. Uh, these substrings would be good. M, M A, M A R. Those are sub ranges of the characters. If you want, maybe it would be helpful if I put back up these string methods. Where is it? Here. So you said substrings. So if I pass in a starting index and a length, it'll give me uh, you know that many characters starting from there. So if I'm going to print M M A M A R, you're saying I want to do S dot substr. What's the start and what's the length? Start where? Zero, like I'm printing these first several lines, so just the zeroth character. How far do I go over? I? Okay, so what if I do C out that? And substr does not modify S. It returns a new string based on S. So I could just try that for a second. Uh, we can just test this stuff, right? Let me, let me comment out everything else because I just want to have an empty main. So let's do name diamond Marty. And what do I get? I get mart. It's pretty close, right? Um, the i is the length. It looks like the first line it prints zero characters. So, I mean, maybe we'd want to say like i plus one. Just print one more than that. So now I get up to Marty. Okay, cool. So that's a pretty good start. Um, so. You might say, well, gosh, how do I change this loop to also print this other part? I don't think the same loop has to do the whole work. We could just live with the, the loop that we've got so far. So maybe this part is the first half of the diamond. And maybe we'd write a separate piece of code for the second half. OK? Uh, so how do I print like this stuff? It seems like there's spaces in front of it. So maybe for a second. We could ignore the spaces. Let's just try to print the right little substrings on each line first, okay? So how would I do that part? What do you think? Okay, so it's just, it's, I'm again going to loop through the string, but the indexes are different. So what do you want me to put here, like i? If you only pass one parameter, what that means is go from that index to the end, but in, omit everything before that. Okay, yeah, let's see if we can, let me try that out. What does that do? That's pretty close, but it prints Marty twice. I'm vain, so I like seeing my name two times, but that's not the right output. So um, maybe again, is it I plus one? Start at I plus one. Let's see if that helps. Okay, now it's pretty good, except I want these guys moved over. So how do I move them to the right? What do you think? Oh, could I, could I replace the character with spaces? Yeah, you could. I guess what I was thinking was like, in here I want to do two things. I want to print some number of spaces. And then second, I want to print the substring of S, kind of. So I was preferring not to like mutilate S if I could avoid it. Although I, there's certainly, I think you could do it that way. If you don't mind, I'd rather just sort of figure out how many spaces I need to print and then print that many spaces. Like, how do I know how many spaces need to be printed? Any ideas? Somebody I haven't heard from yet. What do you think? You can take the length of the string subtract i. Length of the string minus i. So if you want to print a character repeatedly, there's no magic command for that. So we just have to do a loop for that. So like a for loop of int j. j is less than something. j plus plus c out space. I'm not saying end all. Don't go down a line. Just move over. And then the question is just how many spaces to move over. But what was your suggestion? S dot length minus i. That might be it. Might be right. It might be off by one. We can try it and see. Um, hmm. Well, I'll tell you one thing. The number of spaces is going up, right? So therefore, if you're subtracting i, that's going to make numbers that go down. So what if it's what if it's just i spaces? What if that works? Okay, that's close, but I'm off by one. It seems like there's a lot of i plus one in this problem, right? So maybe i plus one spaces. Hey, we've got a name diamond. We're so cool. Good job, team.
So anyway, we're just playing with strings. We're playing with string methods. That's the goal here. That's the point of the of the exercise. Um, I'm out of time, so uh, I will let you go. Check out those two sessions tonight and tomorrow. Set up Cute Creator, and I'll email you about section signups tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, everybody. See you later.